thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, very excited to uh, present some of the data that I have collected in the last uh, two and a half, three years now. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Veterinary Animal Sciences at the University of Cop uh, Copenhagen in the group of uh, Luna Brunstedt. And uh, my talk will be about novel bacteriophages for biocontrol of ESPL producing E. coli. There was a different uh, title in the abstract, but I decided to make it a bit more simple here. Um, so what we're talking about when we talk about ESPL producing E. coli, these are uh, usually commensals found in uh, chickens, in uh, pigs, and uh, in cows as well. Um, <clears throat> oops, sorry. Um, as, as I mentioned, they are usually commensals in, in these animals, but they, the main characteristic that they have that they carry ESPL uh, enzymes. So these enzymes are beta lactamase uh, degrading uh, enzymes, and uh, they usually confer resistance to the third generation cephalosporins. Um, they don't cause any diseases in animals, but if there is a transmission to a human reservoir, it can cause uh, disease in humans. And uh, there are very few antibiotics. I think at the moment it's uh, a couple, uh, carbapenems and colistin uh, that are capable of uh, taking care of these infections, which is why it's a global concern. And as I already mentioned, this E. coli are widespread. You can see here at the table that we find them both in the broilers and turkeys and pigs. And this table is uh, the data collected from different countries and prevalence uh, in percentage out of the samples that were found um, collected in the different uh, primary production parts. Um, I already mentioned that uh, since these are commensals, they don't cause diseases in animals. There is no actual treatment or uh, decolonization uh, methods to uh, minimize their numbers in the primary production. Um, second of all, um, uh, lost the thread. Yes, uh, because they're widespread, uh, we also need to find a different uh, strategy. We're looking into uh, using uh, bacteriophages uh, for biocontrol of uh, ESPL producing E. coli, and I just say ESPL EC uh, from now on in primary production. What we want to do is uh, we want to look at the diversity of these uh, strains in primary production. And in our case, this is uh, data from uh, DANMAP, a surveillance program uh, that uh, looks into uh, uh, antibiotic resistance development in uh, Denmark. Uh, second of all, we're going to look into isolation of the phages that are specific to ESPL uh, producing E. coli. We're looking into determining the host range, then we uh, perform genomic characterization and a look at the survival and efficiency of the phages uh, during gut conditions. And that will be one of the last experiments I'm presenting here today. <clears throat> um, so the data that I have here is a collection of ESPL producing E. coli in, uh, collected in Denmark in years 2015 and 2016. That's before I started my project. Um, this is a collection of 198 uh, strains isolated from uh, broilers, uh, broiler meat, and uh, pigs. Um, the majority of them coming from the broiler meat, some of them coming from the broilers, and uh, another half uh, almost is coming from the pig samples. Um, to look at the diversity of the ESPL producing E. coli from this uh, collection, we looked into the core genome, and uh, based on the core genome MLST profile, we built a phylogenetic tree over here. What we can see here that they are quite diverse, because when we look at the different uh, sequence types uh, that are depicted with the different colors here, um, there are 65 different ST types, and um, highlighting the diversity of, uh, of this E. coli. Uh, furthermore, we looked into the different profiles of the beta lactamase genes that they carry, also the different uh, antibiotic genes that they carry along with it, um, and types of plasmids and so on. And uh, now that we know that these strains are quite diverse and that they've been collected all over Denmark, and uh, we would like to see if we can pinpoint some of the strains that we can use for the isolation of the phages. And here we are. Um, you can see this is the same phylogenetic tree that I uh, showed in the previous slides. And in the blue squares outside in the outer circle, you can see this is the strains that I've chosen for the phage isolation. 
And for that, I've tried to cover the, the, the variety and the diversity of the different ST types. Plus, I incorporated some of the data that I, that I have on the uh, different beta-lactamase profiles and uh, plasmid profiles and antibiotic resistance, because we don't know whether these factors may um, affect the phage infectivity. Okay. Um, since the majority of uh, the samples of the SBL producing E. coli were isolated from uh, pigs and chickens, uh, we started looking for the bacteriophages at the sites where we can collect where we of the primary production, for example, of the uh, feces of the chicken. Um, there were six samples of the chicken feces coming from the um, Ross uh, 308 uh, meat producing chicken and the uh, Loman Brown egg laying uh, chickens. Um, then we also had uh, five samples coming from the production plant that collected the pig waste for the biogas uh, production. And finally, since many people isolate bacteriophages from the wastewater and wastewater is a huge reservoir of the bacteriophages, we decided to include some of the samples as well from the wastewater treatment plant here. Um, I've taken two samples from one of these uh, very long, like 12, 15 meter long basins. Uh, so I took uh, some samples of the sewage water as well. So <clears throat> what I did here for the phage isolation, um, as I mentioned, I used 34 uh, different uh, ESPL strains. I used different samples here. That's uh, from the pig waste, chicken feces, and wastewater. Um, and then I used, then I did the, either I did the direct plating, but for example, for the pig waste samples, there were not that many phages that I could catch in this way. And that's why we had to go to the enrichment steps here. And then we did the plaque assay and uh, picked some of the single plaques with different morphologies to try to maximize the, the um, isolation of different bacteriophages. And finally, that's a single plaque isolation and purification. So when we're looking at the different samples, uh, chicken feces, pig waste, and wastewater, we were able to isolate uh, 28 phages belonging to um, different families, and the families are stated here. Uh, the most diversity came of, uh, of the phages came from the wastewater samples. There were some coming from the pig waste and uh, not that many uh, different families from the chicken feces, for example but we were able to isolate phages from every single uh, sample that we had. When looking at the different genera that uh, these phages uh, belong to, uh, the majority were of course coming from the myogridia. I'm not sure whether that was the isolation uh, procedure of the phages that uh, selected for, for, for this type, but the 28 unique phages that uh, I have isolated are belonging to the 14 genera. Uh, the isolation process ended up in isolation of about 75 phages. Out of this, uh, we have uh, sequence 65. And uh, from 65, we ended up in 28 unique phages. Okay. Um, looking at this different uh, genera that we have here, we did sequence analysis. The sequence analysis showed that the phages are genetically diverse. Many of them uh, have... Uh, uh, well, of course, belong to the families of Myviridae, Sifaviridae, and so on. And ge genome sizes were also differing from uh, 39 KB and up to 172 KB. Um, there were also differences in the number of the tRNAs from 2 to 4, 6, 8, 10, and 14. Um, that, of course, also using the different, whether that was the cause of the using of different uh, hosts. But we also ended up having phages uh, with the GC content ranging of 35.3% uh, to 54.5%. And this is once again highlighting how uh, diverse uh, E. coli phages can be. Okay. So we looked at the genetic diversity. Then we also looked at the host range of the phages. And the host range is shown in uh, this uh, graph. Um, on the, when the color is light, there is uh, no uh, phage infection. When the color is uh, dark blue, then you can see phage infection. Um, on the x-axis, you can see there are names of these 28 phages. I have phages, phage stocks. Um, 
And uh, on the y axis, you have a phylogenetic tree of this 198 strains. It's um, working, working with such a big data set is making it a bit difficult to visualize uh, the final data, but I hope you can see. Uh, um, yes. Um, the whole strain shows here that 162 USBL strains, I mean, 82% in total were killed by at least one phage. Some of the phages had broad host range. For example, this is the first one here highlighted in the red box um, phage that I called AV10. It can kill 84 strains. At least this is what I can confirm because um, there are difficulties uh, of these phages placking on the strains. Um, the strains quite often overgrow the plate and the plaques are very small and it's not always uh, possible to confirm the single plaque. But nevertheless, of those that I could uh, confirm, there were 84 strains that particularly this phage could kill. The next uh, most efficient one was uh, the one above it that can kill 65 strains. And uh, I will actually focus on the phage called AV15 that can kill 48 strains. And it's um, one here, but it's not that uh, visible. Um, uh, the phage AV15 uh, has a host range of 48 strains and they are uh, covering a lot of different ST types comp compared, for example, to this one uh, phage that can um, that infects a lot of strains, but many of them are within the same ST type cluster, for example. So the next slides will be about the phage AV15 that we have tested in the small intestine model, the small uh, CSI model that I will call from now on. And this model is um, developed by uh, Thomas Chiplak at the food science uh, department at uh, University of Copenhagen back in 2018. Um, and this is a small reactor that uh, mimics the passage of uh, the passage through the a small intestine that is through the stomach uh, with the duodenum, jejunum, and idiom. And in this way, there is a regulation of the pH uh, from one uh, part of the intestine to another part, to the next, and so on. Um, <clears throat> there are estimated times of passage through, uh, for example, stomach and so on. Um, there's also addition of uh, bile salts that uh, bile salts. Uh, uh, that uh, usually come in the odinum and uh, are usually reabsorbed in the jejunum part. So in this way, when we test the phage, uh, we test the different pH. Uh, that's, uh, for example, from one part to another part. We also test the effect of the different enzymes, for example, uh, pepsin that's in the stomach and pancreatin that's also coming in with the bile salts over here. And uh, finally, survival of the phages through different stages and uh, how many phages we can get out of here. Uh, when we were looking at the point where we should add the E. coli uh, in the pig model, this is the pig model I'm talking about here, um, that majority of the E. coli are actually in the odinum and a little bit in jejunum and a bit less in ileum. And of course, in the colon, uh, a lot of them, but uh, since we're testing this model, I added the uh, bacteria at this point. And the points that I was looking at is point one, that's uh, after passage, uh, after an hour passage through the stomach and uh, half an hour through the odinum, that's the next sample. Third sample is after passage through jejunum, four hours uh, later. And the last sample is seven hours, uh, seven and a half hours uh, passage uh, here. The phages that I'm going to look at is, uh, summarized the date on the phage is summarized in this uh, table. But I'm going to talk about the phage AV15 that uh, is a member of myelurideo and a member of Mosif virus and uh, with a genome size of 170 KB. Um, looking at the host range of these different phages, uh, the first phage, as I mentioned, was able to kill 84 strains, the next 65, 55, 48, and 46. But when we look, uh, if, we, if we're going to try to make a phage cocktail of, out of this, uh, the, the accumulated number of strains that they can together infect is uh, getting higher and higher here. So from the first one, it's 84, with the next one, 95, 114, and up to 144 if we use all five phages. But that's, of course, if... Uh, our um, test in the small intestine and uh, in animals will be successful, of course. Um, 
Yes, so I've tasted, I've tested uh, phage AV15 in the small intestine model. I've added the phage to the stomach, and then I've added some uh, E. coli uh, to the duodenum part, and then I've looked into uh, um, colony forming units of the bacteria, development of the bacteria throughout here, and uh, the, the same for the phage, having control of a phage and a control of a bacteria alone to see the dynamics. So in the first graph here, you can see when uh, uh, this is the different sampling points. This is after stomach passage, after uh, duodenum, after jejunum, and the uh, final uh, after idiom uh, before it reaches the column. Um, here we can see that the, this is the log 10 CFU per milliliter of the bacteria. And uh, in red, uh, this is the bacteria control that wasn't exposed to the phages. And this is the bacteria that was exposed to the phages. Um, and here we can see that after the passage, uh, the bacteria, after already, after half an hour, we can see a slow increase in the bacteria in the controls and so on and so on. Um, when we add the phage, there is a slow increase and slow decrease and meaning that the phages are efficiently killing uh, the bacteria. When we look at the phage alone, uh, here's the control for the phage and here's the phage uh, with the bacteria. Uh, phage alone is decreasing in the titer because we're also adding some of the fluids and taking out some of the fluids. Perhaps also the pH is affecting and the bile salts affecting the, the, the phages, uh, phage viability. But we can also see clearly that uh, already from the second point, that's after the odinum, that we can see increase of the phages. That is the part here takes about half an hour for the, uh, for the, in, in the duodenum part where the phage is already with the bacteria and then the, the, the phage is infecting and starts propagating in that uh, host. Um, and in the final table here, I want to show you uh, when I put the data for the phages uh, in these two um, lines and uh, for the bacteria, we can see the dynamics that's uh, going on in the, in the chamber. This is the control for the this is control for the bacteria. Oh, sorry. In the red is the control for the bacteria, and in the blue is control for the phage. In yellow, this is the bacteria phage count uh, over time uh, through the passage, and this is the bacterial count after the passage with the phage. So we can clearly see this was a pilot study, but we can clearly see that with the addition of the phage to the system. Um, we can clearly decrease the number of the ESPL producing E. coli. So in, on this note, uh, I have a few concluding marks. Um, uh, in this project, I've isolated 28 unique phages using 34 different uh, ESPL producing E. coli that uh, together can target up to 82% uh, of the ESPL producing E. coli in the collection. The phages are suitable for biocontrol. Uh, these 28 phages are elitic uh, phages and have no undesirable genes, uh, such as uh, uh, virulence genes that they could carry over or an antibiotic resistance genes. Um, yes, and in conditions uh, that mimic uh, gut passage, at least the stomach passage and the small intestine passage, uh, phage AV15 was capable of reducing the numbers of E. coli by three log. Um, yeah, and uh, I think uh, specific phages to ESPL producing E. coli can be successfully isolated and show great potential for biocontrol. I'd like to thank uh, my group and I would also like to thank uh, Familia Gersfond for Lenpo, that's the funding uh, unit here. And, uh, Professor Dennis Andres Nielsen and PhD student Rasmus Rimo Jakobsen for helping me out at the Department of Food Science to uh, use uh, their TSI model. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I'm ready for questions if uh, you have any.